everyone, and welcome back to the Dorky Dunkleosteus. It has been way too long, and I, I honestly admit, um, it has been way too long. I, I apologize for that. Um, COVID-19 absolutely fucking sucks. I'm sorry. It, it, it sucks. Um, I'm finally back to work. My normal jobs. I'm finally feeling awesome. I'm finally back into the groove and I'm so happy to be back and doing these. Um, I'm going to try and do this again every single week, eight o'clock Monday morning, every week. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, hopefully I can. I'll, I'll let's keep up. All right. So let us start. Let us begin this week. We are talking about crocodilians through the ages. I love me some crocodiles. I love my, my, my crocodile boys. Absolutely love them. All right, so crocodiles actually belong to a branch uh, in cladistics, a branch of animals called archosaurs. So there are two other members of the archosaurian family, which are pterosaurs and dinosaurs. Of course, this includes modern birds. Archosaurs are identified by the most predominantly by their skull openings. There is one post-nasal opening, which you see there in the purplish, the upper post-orbital, which is the red, and the lower post-orbital, post mean in the in the teal. Now, these three openings are universal, and it can be it can be a little weird though because some archosaurs actually lost one, two, or all three of these openings. Um, more likely or not, you're just going to have one opening that disappears. Um, for dinosauria, it is often the upper and lower post-orbital -orbi openings actually merge together into one large post-orbital opening. You can see this really common in a lot of uh, large theropods and theropod dinosaurs in general. You also see this in birds. But because we have a fairly good representation of how these dinosaurs and how these archosaurs evolve over time, we know generally how they evolve to have these openings. So crocodiles, we're just going to be focusing on. So what makes a crocodile? Crocodiles um, can be differentiated by birds and pterosaurs because of their wrist. Now, there's a lot of other ways. This is, for me, the easiest way to remember them. So when it comes to differentiating a crocodile from a pterosaur, you have two different types of wrists, quote unquote. It's actually part of um, the wrist and ankle joint. This joint um, is loose in crocodiles and fused, quote unquote, in birds and dinosaurs. This means kind of, it's kind of weird because we're getting into some really deep anatomy. Um, and I want to do a shout out to my Facebook paleontology group because they helped me with this. I forgot the names of these two bones. So we have the astralagus and the calcaneum. Now, in a crocodile wrist, the astralagus actually has a little indent, a little growth, a little spur, if you will, that sits into a nice little groove in the calcaneum. Now, crocodile reversed is the other way around. The calcaneum, which here we see in red, actually has a protrusion that sits in a nice little, nice little groove in the astralagus. Now, with a crocodile wrist, in normal, crocodile normal, this means, and if you've seen crocodiles walking today, they have very similar wrists to ours. They can flatten those palms right out and they can really boogie. Now, with birds and dinosaurs and pterosaurs, they walked on their toes because the wrist joint or the ankle joint is actually fused because the calcaneum is attached to the tibia. I'm sorry, the ulna, one of the, it's, okay, it's either the ulna or the radius in the arm, and it's the tibia and the fibia, fibula in the leg. Um, the calcaneum is the one that, in crocodile normal, is, in, in all of them, is fused, quote unquote, it's not really fused as much as it has a very robust tendon that keeps it in place. Now, if obviously in uh, normal, crocodile normal, the astrolagus is able to pivot because it's not connected to the bone that's above it. 
the wrist, the part of the bone that's the forearm or the lower leg. Um, in reverse, it would technically be the calcaneum that would be pivoting, but it can't because it actually has some really robust tendons attaching it to the bone that's above it. So this is why birds and dinosaurs, they walk on their toes. Um, this is kind of similar to, um, if you imagine it, it's not it's not exactly similar, but it's a good analogy. It's very um, it's easy to think, you know, how cats they walk on their toes, their their big fat you know wrist. They they walk on their tippy toes. Same with dogs, um, birds especially. If you look at an ostrich, um, ostriches especially because they look like they have backward knees. Well, no, their backwards knee quote unquote is actually their ankle, so they walk on their tiptoes. But we're not talking about birds, not talking about dinosaurs or, or cats. We're talking about crocodiles. All right. So when did crocodiles first appear? Now, a lot of people don't, they know that the crocodiles are older than dinosaurs. But that's not exactly true. Because true crocodiles actually came in around 95 million years ago. That's the late uh, Cretaceous. The crocodilian branch actually stretches back to 250 million years ago. That is the Triassic Permian extinction. So when we go back to 250 million years ago, we're looking at Pseudosaurischia, or frost crocodiles. These are diversified in the early Triassic and were actually major competitors to dinosaurians. So um, in the early Triassic, Dinosaurs were just starting to get their toe holds along with crocodiles. There were still Permian mammals, or I should say, they're not really Permian mammals. They're those weird reptilian-like mammals, or mammal-like reptiles that existed in the Permian. So we're talking Demetrodon, Gorgonopsis, these animals that were weirdly reptilian, but also mammalian. We're actually distantly related to those guys. So they were trying to fill in the gaps that were left when these early mammal-like reptiles finally kicked the bucket at the end of the Permian and slowly died out, well, fairly quickly died out into the Triassic. So they were all small, omnivorous, and generally um, just generalizing in, in survival. So, Triassic pseudosaurischians include Saurosuchus, Prestosuchus, Postosuchus, and Poposaurus. I love these names. I love Poposaurus. That one's, that one's just fun to say. So, let's take a closer look at these early pseudosaurischians. Now, immediately, we've got some skulls here. And to be completely honest, they look super similar to some late Cretaceous dinosaurs. Let's take a look at the skull of Prestosuchus there in the middle on the, the right-hand side. So this was a South American um, pseudo Saurischia member, recognized for its upright stance while walking unlike modern crocodiles. And we can see that skull. We can see it's got the nose opening right in front. We have the post-nasal opening, that big old gap there. The orbital is right behind that. And then we have that weird little opening that's a combination of the upper and lower openings. Now, um, Prestosuchus, again, this was a bipedal animal. So it, it walked upright. So its hips and its shoulders, well, actually, it's more of its hips were fully erect underneath its stance. So rather than that, you know, wide bulldog stance that you see modern crocodiles go, this guy, he was fully upright. His belly wasn't dragging. Let's jump back up to Sarosuchus, a ground-dwelling six to nine meter or 20 to 30 foot Pseudosaurischia that lived in the late Triassic in South America. So we're seeing a lot of these Pseudosaurischians in South America. Um, and then we have Postosuchus down below. This one was bipedal. So Prestosuchus was upright. And so that would be like you or me on our hands and knees. We can lift our belly right up. Prestosuchus did this. Now, Postosuchus, it was actually bipedal. You can kind of see it in the image there. It kind of got cut off, but it was actually bipedal. So it was able to balance itself on its hind legs. This is something that we see um, again later in crocodilians. Uh, and then, of course, this guy is from North America, actually, and he is from post-Texas. 
Um, Posto Sukas is a lot of fun. Uh, he was, again, if you look at the, the recreation there, he is weird looking. He's definitely looks like a dinosaur, but he also really does look like a crocodile. Now, again, these are pseudo Saurischians or false crocodiles. But to be honest, they're actually the line in which true crocodiles come from. So let's jump to the Triassic and Jurassic extinction. By the time of the extinction event, most Pseudosaurischians went extinct. Their extinction led the way to the diversification of Dinosauria, but Pseudosaurischians did have survivors. Crocodilomorphs are the survivors. This branch that would become modern crocodiles and their relatives managed to get past the Triassic-Jurassic extinction. Now, crocodile morphs had to compete at first, but would soon be large enough to prey on dinosaurs who took over the Earth. So, these guys would compete in the Jurassic. Now, the Jurassic Age for dinosaurs is when we get some really awesome, awesome looking dinosaurs. We get Stegosaurus. We get the large sauropods as well. This is when the dinosaurs really came into their own um, in the Jurassic. And then we get even bigger in the Cretaceous. So, in the early Jurassic... Dinosaurs and crocodilomorphs had to actually compete. They were all still medium-sized, mid-sized, and generally they were just starting to diversify into specializations. Let's take a look at the dino hunters of yore, the Jurassic crocodilians. Through the Jurassic crocodilo, through the Jurassic crocodiliforms diversified and expanded as dinosauria expanded into larger niches that were open to them. Some of these early, most notable crocodilians include Mysteriosaurus and Machimosaurus. Now you notice there is a distinction between the, um, the post, the, the, the ends of their names. We're getting into Saurus, which is lizard. So obviously these guys aren't lizards, they're Saurischians. They are crocodiles, they're crocodilomorphs. So let's take a look at these guys. So we have, first up, Mysteriosaurus. I love that name. This was a long, narrow-snouted crocodilomorph, known for a fairly intact skulls, quite a few of them actually, from England, could reach estimated lengths of up to 4 meters or 13 feet. Now, if we take a look at the skull that is on the, the right there, we can see that really long snout. And that, to me, reminds me of a freshwater crocodile from Australia. Um, or as the late, great Steve Irwin would say, the Freshies. Now, this is where we can start to see how these animals diversified. When you see freshwater crocodiles, they have those long, narrow snouts. They are freshwater and they hunt primarily fish. And this is assumed to be what Mysteriosaurus did. It lived in a, in a water-like environment and it didn't have to worry about the dinosaurs so much because they weren't getting in the in to the water. They weren't getting their toes wet for various reasons. We still had some really notable uh, marine reptiles that were in the water at the time um, of the Jurassic and then would start to compete more and more in the marine environments. Not so much the freshwater lakes, bogs, and that kind of stuff. Next, Machimosaurus. So this is another long-snouted uh, early crocodilian from Europe, and we believe that this one, from estimations of its skull, could have reached lengths of 7.2 meters, or over 23 feet. Here we have some really cool recreations, and this looks straight up like a gigantic freshwater crocodile. It really does. And we have a scuba diver there as an example of how large uh, a human, average human, would be. These guys were big. They look crocodile-like. Um... And that's simply because that design of crocodiles is perfect for archosaurs who prefer the water and who evolved primarily to be in the water over time, um, became, becoming semi-aquatic. Now, that is not to say that birds um, like penguins and others would have had, um, wouldn't have had a similar thing if they had evolved back then. Um, in fact, if you look at penguins and um, diving birds, they often have some similar features, um, but they're airborne, so they don't, well, fly, the diving birds are. Penguins, not so much. They're, they're terrestrial, but they've evolved to into their niche. Crocodiles, 
they just took right to it. But they're not always going to be this really easy to notice um, crocodile form. So, the age of the dinosaur eat eaters. So we're looking at Cretaceous age crocodiles. In the Cretaceous, crocodile forms got big and they got hungry for dinosaurs. Not just relegated to the rivers and salty waters, large terrestrial crocodile forms ran bipedally and upright after the dinosaurs that ruled the land. Some even hunted large hadrosaurs. Notable individuals include Caprosuchus, Dinosuchus, and Sarcosuchus. So let's take a look at these Cretaceous crocodiles. Now, these are the big boys. Really, it's the big two and kind of a, one that's my personal favorite. I bet you can probably guess which one it is. It's Caprosuchus. I love Caprosuchus with such a passion. It is so interesting. One, we are known from, we know this animal from a nearly complete skull and that's about it. So Caprosuchus means boar crocodile. And if you take a look at that skull, that looks like boar tusks. Those are its actual teeth that jut out from it. So this animal was discovered in Niger, Africa. Um, the black line in that photo is 10 centimeters. So that's a scale on it. That's, that's pretty big. Um, Caprosuchus was estimated to get to about six meters or around 19.7 feet. And this guy was terrestrial absolutely terrestrial. And how do we know that? We look at its skull. So if we look at that skull, we can see it's got the nasal openings, kind of, you can kind of see them. They're kind of blocked by its teeth. Then you have a very tiny uh, post-nasal opening. And then right up on top, you see those up on top of the skull, but facing forward eye sockets. So that is the biggest clue there that this animal was terrestrial. Its eyes were up higher. It actually had platform like, you know, snout and they faced forward. Now all crocodiles today have eyes that are on top of their skulls and nasal openings that are on the top. And that is to help them breathe underwater. But their eyes are faced slightly wider so they can have a better vision as in multiple directions because they're, they're working in a 3D environment. Caprosuchus needed binocular vision. And I wish I could have found a really good image of it facing forward, that skull, because you'll be able to see it has really good binocular vision. And if you remember in our other episodes where we talk about binocular vision and how important it is to predators, we can see and extrapolate, hmm, that thing's got binocular vision, that thing's gonna be a hunter. And we can guess that from other previous terrestrial crocodilians, this guy was most likely bipedal or functionally bipedal. What do you mean by functionally bipedal? What I mean is that like hadrosaurs, they could walk on all fours, but in times where they need speed or they need to get away from something, lift and tuck, lift and tuck those front legs and start going. Now it is theorized that Caprosuchus and some of its other relatives could have used the hands, the forelimbs, to grapple um, food and prey items. And I, I think that's a pretty sound idea. Um, that's one thing that I wish I, I, now I wish I would have added to this, um, are demonstrations of the hands of crocodiles. Um, you can kind of see it in the next picture, which is Dinosuchus. They have five fingers. They have five fingers. Um, they have claws only on their thumb, index, and middle finger. Uh, and they haven't lost their pinky or their ring fingers. So if you think about it, um, this Cretaceous crocodile, you know, Caprosuchus being bipedal, it could have been that it would have had those nice three, four, those three claws on the forelimbs and be able to grab and wrestle. Um, most likely it would have used ambush tactics as well because ambush tactics work. Um, especially if you're a solo, uh, creature and, most likely since the behavior of crocodiles today is to be a solo predator, that's what we're gonna see in the past. Simply because these guys fill a niche that's so perfect for them. Let's talk about Dinosuchus. That's the terrible crocodile. So Dino, meaning terrible, we've also seen Dinonychus, 
which is the terrible claw. Well, now we're talking about Dinosuchus, a large semi-aquatic aquatic reptile. Why did I say semi-aquatic aquatic? Or aquatic semi-aquatic? That's because it's more like an actual, I shouldn't say actual, a more like a modern crocodile form. So reaching up to 12 meters or 31 feet, this animal resembled modern crocodiles in all of in all ways, except for the size. This thing was huge. Its first remains were discovered in North Carolina in the United States. So this guy is from North America. And I, oh, I wish I had that picture in it now. So there was a picture that I found on Facebook that shows a Dinosuchus skull. And sitting in between its lower jaw was an alligator skull. A North American alligator skull. That thing is huge. Um, so how do we figure out these ratios is actually by the length of the skull. Scientists know modern crocodiles have a specific ratio of length to skull to length of body. That's how we're getting these estimations. Um, some of these we do have nearly complete specimens. A lot of times though we just find these heads, which is kind of cool. And as you can see with, uh, Deinonychus, or I'm not sorry, Dinosuchus, you can definitely see it's built for the water. Eyes up on the top of the head, but wider spaced apart, facing kind of sideways. And of course, we see it even more in Sarcosuchus, which is next, or the flesh crocodile. Ooh, that sounds so creepy. Flesh crocodile, Sarcosuchus. <laughs> a member of an extinct branch outside of crocodiliform. So this actually is not a true crocodiliform. This is something just outside of it. But it is, it is definitely a relative. So Sarcosuchus Imperador could have reached up to 9.1 meters or 29.9 feet, nearly 30 feet in length. It is only dwarfed by Dinosuchus. This, uh, found, this, this animal was found in Lake Cretaceous deposits of Africa and South America. So now we're seeing a little bit of a correlation. We're seeing crocodile forms near crocodiliforms or um, extinct branches outside of crocodiliforms, mainly in Africa and South America. When we're seeing a lot of these other ones is North America. So if we get our mental puzzle piece of the globe together, you can actually shove South America right up into the, the ear and um, nose of Africa, and you can kind of slide North America in there and on top as well. So. This is where we get a little bit of paleogeography going on, fitting all of these pieces back together and realizing, okay, so what was different back then? Um, it's a lot of a lot of work and it's really cool. And a lot of times we rely on geologists examining the rocks, um, especially fossiliferous rocks, to find out clues. So beyond the KT extinction, I know that today um, a lot of scientists don't call it the KT extinction again. K um, being representative for Cretaceous and T for the tertiary, um, simply because they've changed the name of tertiary to something else. I reference it as KT extinction. Um, if this is not valid anymore, hey, let me know um, and I will try to get my vocabulary updated. It is easier for me right now to say KT extinction because I can't remember what the updated extinction name is. So after the meteor impact at um, the Yucatan Peninsula, many of the diverse crocodile relatives would not make it through that. But those that did would become some imposing creatures and eventually become today's modern crocodiles. Our early ancestors were stalked by water by, and by large crocodilians, including Crocodilus thorbjarnarstens. Oh, here I go again. First video back and I'm butchering names. Thorbjarnosani and Purusaurus. I love Purusaurus. I love Purusaurus. It's very pretty sounding. Purusaurus. Puri, puri, purisaurus. So, the giant crocodiles of yesteryear. Crocodilus Thorbjarnarsoni is a 7.6 meter or 25 foot crocodile of Kenya from the Pliocene and Pleistocene eras of the same uh, country. This guy may have hunted early humans. Um, so these are both, uh, paleo reconstructions of the animals. 
So these guys are nearly indistinguishable from what we know as modern animals. Um, Crocodilus has kind of a weird looking skull. It's very wide, but not as wide as Purosaurus. Um, Purosaurus definitely has a wide, almost pancakey looking like skull with a very large nose. It's got a very robust nose. Um, so Putosaurus uh, is 10.3 meters or 35 feet crocodile from South America in the Miocene. The only number two in length to Dinosuchus. So this guy was in the Miocene. So this was, again, pretty recent. These were our, our ancestors um, and early humans that would have been eaten by this guy. And most likely they would have. Um, South America, we still have, you know, early primates, um, the Miocene, you know, stuff is, stuff is getting weird. Uh, we're not quite into the Ice Age, but these guys are, these guys are pretty intense. They are very heavy bodied. Um, and again, this is, that looks to me like a saltwater crocodile if I'm not looking at the skull. It is, it is amazing to see how much these animals have really not changed. They had unique individuals, I should say, I should say individuals, I should say unique species and genuses, but the body plan for crocodiles has worked from the start pretty much. So they haven't changed. This is why um, the body plan for anything aquatic and marine tends to look like a fish. I know we got into this in another episode before about how fish aren't all fish. I still don't know how to touch that one because I don't know enough about ichthyology to actually tackle that insane tangled web of what is a fish and what is not a fish and what fish is a fish but is not a fish. All I know, crocodiles. Crocodiles are cool. Crocodiles have been around for a very, very long time. So these guys are the closest living relatives to birds. Um, they, along with birds, are the only two remainer, remaining members of the Archosaurian clade. Today's crocodilians may not reach the epic 10 plus meters of their ancestors, but they are amazing genera of animals that have survived since the early Triassic. The largest known crocodilian was Lo Long, a saltwater crocodile measuring 6.17 meters or 20.24 feet, who was captured in the Philippines September 3rd of 2011. He passed away two years later on February 10th, 2013 due to pneumonia. His skin was taxidermied and his skeleton is preserved uh, and they were both on display at the Philippines National Museum. So this is an image of Lolong. Um, he is a Philippine saltwater crocodile, which is a critically endangered species, I believe. It's, it's one of the, the species that is endangered, if not critically endangered. Um, there is though a mythic monster that could out, lo, out lo long, lo long. I'm talking about Gustav of the Ruzizi, Ruzizi River. I love chucking up on Gustav. Gustav of the Ruzizi River. This Nile crocodile that lived in the Ruzizi River in Africa has reportedly been a man eater reaching over 5.5 meters or 18 feet. Gustav killing over 300 people allegedly. He is estimated to be over the age of 60 and was last seen in 2015, not 2115, 20155, eating a large buffalo. Not only was he a man eater, but he was bulletproof. There are three scars that mark him from bullets and possibly spears. It is reported that he has been killed in 2019, but has not been confirmed. Gustav is my favorite modern crocodile. And I say this because he is a dragon. Uh, if anyone has ever seen the movie Primeval or has seen Lake Placid, they got, well, especially Primeval. Primeval was actually supposed to be uh, named Gustav um, after this specific crocodile. Um, and I mean, Lake Placid had Betty White in it and I love Betty White and her watching her feed the cow to the giant crocodile was really cool. Um, I love Betty White. Uh, so they got a lot of inspiration from Gustav um, of the Ruzizi River. He, if he is still alive, 
it's very possible that he stood, still could be alive. Um, Nile crocodiles have been known to reach over 100 years of age. Um, the interesting thing about Gustav is in photos like the one on the right, you see that his teeth are actually in very good shape. Now, generally, as I'm sure everybody has known, uh, even in the human race, as we get older, our teeth start to wear out. This is true for crocodiles. Once they reach generally 60 or older, their teeth start to get really bad. They're rotting, they, um, obviously they don't brush their teeth, so that's a big problem, you know? Cause then they're gonna get, you know, gingivitis and all this shit, well they do. <laughs> they do, they generally lose teeth and they're not able to replace them as quickly or at all uh, past a point, certain point. And, but Gustav, in photographs we've seen of Gustav, he is a very, very, very interesting animal. His teeth, at least in some of the really good, some of the photos that we can be confirmed are of him that are closer up. His teeth are still in very good condition. Also, you can kind of see in this photo, his head is weird. And what I mean by his head is weird is it looks more like an alligator skull. So let me, let me give you a little bit of physics lesson. Everybody knows that you can hold a crocodile or alligator's mouth shut with your bare hands or just 10 or so loops of duct tape. It's the power in the bite coming down that that is where all their power is. They can't open their jaws very much. Now, the skull of crocodilians uh, is dense, but it will succumb to forces that outweigh it. Effectively saying that physically, the bone of a, a skull, the, bo the bones of a crocodile or alligator's skull are what limits how much pressure they can bite with. So, Obviously, even humans, we can bite down as hard as we wanted to. We're not going to bite down very hard, though, because our brain and our body will tell us to stop. How? Because we'll break things like teeth or jaws. Crocodiles are the same way. Crocodilians, same way. They can bite down pretty damn hard. They can snap their jaws shut. Almost, Actually, I believe they snap their jaws shut with more force or equal to, or just below force of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So we're talking about couple, like 38,000 Newtons of force. Now, if they were to max that out, they would break their jaws. They would break their heads. So that is the limit. Now, I don't know how many of my viewers uh, watch or know of like the whole you know, karate thing where, you know, every time you, you punch somebody, you get micro fractures that grow back. So you punch like a tree a hundred million times and your fist becomes stronger as ever. That does have some truth to it, especially for crocodiles. They do actually have micro fractures and these micro fractures will regrow stronger. That is what happens. And that is what we believe is what happens with Gustav. His skull has become so robust with the micro fractures, with either taking damage from animals, taking damage from humans, taking damage from his own bite, that his skull has begun to literally bulk up enough that he can bite harder because there's literally more strength coming back out of that skull. So I, I don't want to sound horrible, but I kind of hope Gustav is still alive because I want to scientifically, all right, so scientifically, I know he is an amazing specimen that I would like us to find and study. Um, there was an attempt to catch him, but it failed. Now, if he is dead, I hope that we can confirm it and get the body so that we can study him. He's really interesting. Now that makes kind of like horrible because he's a known man eater or at least a man killer. Um, there's rumors that he literally just will leave body parts along rivers. Um, and that makes sense. I mean, we're not, we're not very fleshy. We don't have a lot to us that it would be appetizing. It's a lot of work to digest bone. 
But somehow this this Gustav has actually managed to get that that kind of you know reputation. Um, I don't know. On one hand, I really hope he is still alive, and that maybe we can capture him, or maybe if he if he is dead, that whoever did kill him or whoever has his remains will turn it over to science so we can study him because he is or was an amazing specimen. I absolutely love Gustav. I absolutely love crocodiles. So what is the fate of these archosaurs? Several species of crocodilians are endangered, but conservation efforts can easily save these just as the American alligator was pulled from near extinction to now at least concerned status. When I was growing up in the early 90s, the American alligator was considered critically endangered. So much so that there were literally people were trying to save this animal. Well, their conservation efforts worked. They worked so well um, with actually, and they were working with alligator farms. So alligator farms, especially in the Southeast, they actually breed and harvest alligator meat um, and skin and bones and stuff because it's profitable. They worked, the conservationists actually worked with legitimate um, alligator farms and started to reintroduce alligators to the Everglades. They also started cleaning up the Everglades and now they are back in such numbers that we don't have to worry. I mean, obviously we still want to worry because if we slip back into old habits like we did in the 80s, 70s, and 80s, then we're going to lose them again or come close to losing them. So they've become a success story. Now, the Philippine crocodile, Cuban crocodile, Siamese crocodile, and slender snouted crocodile, among many other species, are critically endangered. Although the stuff of many nightmares, crocodilians are important to the ecosystem and need all the help that humans can give them. They are very important. They are apex predators. They are at the top of the food chain. Yes, it is horrible when somebody gets attacked by um, crocodiles in, or alligators in the US or Australia or Africa. Absolutely. But at the same time, we need to respect these animals for what they are. They are animals. They are living their lives. And they are amazing. And without alligators, we would have an overpopulation of fish. We would have overpopulation of animals. We would have an overpopulation of turtles. All of this, it would collapse from the top down because everything would go out of whack. Um, so please, if we can, you know, do something, hey, you know, when you're going out and you're, you know, shopping for souvenirs, if you go overseas, please do not buy alligator or crocodile or crocodilian products. One, it's illegal pet trade or it's illegal trade, period. That's shit's illegal um, to bring it into the United States. That's considered poaching um, and everything. If you're in the US, you can buy legally sourced alligator and have alligator meat. I've had alligator jerky. It's actually pretty good. I would love to try actual alligator meat just to try it because we have a stable population. Not only do we have a stable population, but we have almost an overpopulation. We're doing so well. We have. Um, we have legitimate farms and processes and hunters that help so that we can live in peace. Crocodiles were here way before us. Crocodilians, they were here first. We need to take care of them and we need to take care of this planet. So I'll get off my soapbox. So here are the references, quite a lot, quite a lot from Wikipedia, but you know, whatever. Um, so again, I am so happy to be back and doing these episodes again. Uh, I hope you all have had a wonderful time. I hope you guys are all healthy. I hope you're staying safe. I hope that life is treating you well. And I hope that you will join me again next week. So if you liked the video, please leave a like and leave a comment. If you have a suggestion for another episode, if you have a suggestion for a topic, topic leave, it in the, leave it in the comments. Remember to ring that bell. I'm going to try and start doing um, live streams again. I've got an actual gaming computer that will be coming, and I'm so excited. I'm going to get ARC for, my com for that computer, and I'm going to play it. I'm going to actually have a legit live streaming computer. Um, so, yeah. Hey. Uh, you know, 
thank you so much for being here. I love you all. I want you all to stay safe, stay smart, and remember, keep on digging, everyone. And I will see you next week. Have a great one, and bye-bye.